answer. It's just that he gives me no answer. I just decided that I was going to keep asking just to let him know that he doesn't get to control the media policies. I had no uh, aspirations that I was going to change him or anything, but I just wanted to send the message that, hey, we're still going to be here asking questions no matter what you guys might do. You know, somebody last night at the game told me this would never happen if David Stern was still the commissioner. He would not have let it gotten this far. The theory is that Adam Silver is too soft on the players. He lets the players sort of carte blanche, do whatever they want. David Stern would have nipped this in the bud. Uh, Barry Trammell, once again, a veteran, well-respected reporter. And, Richard, it's worth noting that Warriors coach Steve Kerr came out and said that what Russ is doing is, quote, dangerous to the league. How much of a problem do you have with the way he handles the media? Well, I, I think when, first of all, you know, let's talk about Steve Kerr, right? Now, I, I, you know, Arizona guy, that's my guy. You know, but when you look at, you know, how maybe his team handles the media at times, they're not the most media friendly, like when you look at the entire team. But I don't really like what, what Barry said. It, it, he's like, oh, well, we're still going to be here. He can't control the media. That's not true because so many times we always talk to players and say, well, you don't have to do these interviews. You don't have to answer these questions. So, look, if he doesn't want to answer these questions, like when you really listen to the undertones, and I'm not saying that Trammell is not a great reporter and he's not well respected, but it, if you really want to listen to what Russell wants to say or doesn't want to say, that's his choice. If he wants to give short answers or don't want to answer questions, questions uh, about a situation or from a reporter, that's his prerogative. And then you want to blame Adam Silver or you want to say that uh, um, uh, the, the former commissioner wouldn't have allowed this. I think you're looking for blame at other people's why someone just doesn't want to talk to you particularly. It does sound somewhat personal between Trammell and Westbrook. And again, uh, Trammell's been there for a very long time, as has Russ. I have a feeling that that is not over. Meantime, though, Richard, thank you. Unique perspective on that topic. As always, thank you for joining us. In the meantime, you enjoy the games. And, and how about this game tonight again? In the last two postseasons, keep this in, in mind. Russ has tried everything in his power to keep the Thunder alive when they've been on the brink. He scored at least 45 points, grabbed 10 boards in each of his last three playoff games facing elimination. But Oklahoma City has won just one one of those games and lost both series. In the East, we know the Celtics and Bucks are going to square off in the second round. Tony Kornheiser and Michael Wilbon will join us to answer a tough question. Who's more important to their team, Giannis or Kyrie? That's coming up. Sage, just over a week after Luke Walton got a new head coaching job, he faces serious allegations in a sexual assault lawsuit. Our insider, Adrian Wojnarowski, has the very... Oh, my goodness. Wow. That's ridiculous, people. He's giving you everything he could possibly give. And here comes Giannis. The Bucks and their march as the number one team continues. Well, we'll get the 1-4 matchup a lot of people were looking for in the East. The Greek Freak and Kyrie, Milwaukee and Boston. Giannis coming off of 41 points in 32 minutes in the clincher last night against Detroit. The fewest minutes for a 40-point game in NBA playoff history. As for Kyrie, he led the Celtics, averaging over 22 points per game in their sweep over the Pacers. and marks Boston's first four-game winning streak in two and a half months. So, thing is, we don't know when the series will begin yet, but when the long layovers end, the Bucks are the clear favorite over the Celtics in this second-round matchup. Westgate has Milwaukee at minus 300, so you'll have to bet 300 bucks just to win 100. Back to Kyrie and Giannis. Listen to this from PTI. Kornheiser and Wilbon, take it away. Hi, Wilbon. Who is more important to their team, Kyrie Irving or Giannis Antetokounmpo? Giannis, and this isn't close. As great as Kyrie Irving is, he is great. He's already wearing a championship ring. Giannis hopes to get one. We have seen the Boston Celtics play successfully over a long stretch without Kyrie Irving, over That's the right. most important stretch of the That's season, right. which right. is the postseason. They had LeBron James on the ropes and defeated last year without Kyrie Irving. Milwaukee can't do that without Antetokounmpo. And I like some of, the, some of the parts, some of the ensemble pieces. Glad Malcolm Brogdon, presumably, is coming back soon. They need him. But Antetokounmpo, Tony, Milwaukee is close to a lottery team without Antetokounmpo. So I, it's going to sound like I'm disagreeing with you because I'm going to take the other side, but I don't necessarily disagree. Okay. I think Antetokounmpo plays closer to his best more often than Kyrie Irving. Okay. So I don't know how much he can improve the Bucks from where they are. I think that Kyrie Irving is the wild card in this sense, and I, and I want to be very clear about this. Having that ring means something. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we talked today on our show about Bryce Harper and Jake Arrieta, and you made the point that Arrieta has a World Series ring. 
Kyrie Irving was a star in yep. a game seven yep. in a decisive game. So he's got something in him that we haven't seen from the other guy just Not yet. yet. Haven't seen it yet. So my, my feeling would be if Kyrie Irving plays to the top okay. of the ladder that he's got, okay. that has more of an effect on his team than whatever the Greek freak can Really do. quickly. If you were starting, you disagree team, with that? I, no, I don't really disagree with that because I, I, the value of a ring yeah, should yeah, yeah, be yeah, yeah, underestimated. Yeah. Real quickly, though, if you were starting a team, you're going to build a team today. Would you take Kyrie first or Antetokounmpo first? I, I'm partial to guards, but I think I would take Antetokounmpo first. Okay. I do. I think we'd be in agreement again. That's it. We're done. Back to you. Coach with the Sacramento Kings, Luke Walton is being sued for sexual assault by a former sports reporter. Kelly Tennant contends that Walton assaulted her in a hotel room in Santa Monica in 2016 when he was still an assistant coach with the Warriors. Tennant, who was a TV host in L.A. at the time of the alleged assault, said in her lawsuit that she met Walton at the Casa del Mar Hotel to drop off a copy of her book for which he wrote the foreword. Walton then allegedly invited Tennant to his room so they would not be seen together by any Warriors players. That's when she says he pinned her to the bed, forcibly kissing and groping her, using his full body weight to keep her on the bed, and laughed when she yelled stop. The lawsuit also alleges that Walton continued to harass her after he became the coach of the Lakers while she was covering the team, including in May of 2017 when she says he, quote, forced an aggressive hug, end quote, and made an offensive remark about Tennant's outfit at a charity event. Walton's attorney calls the allegations baseless and calls Tennant, quote, an opportunist, not a victim, and her claim is not credible, end quote. Our insider, Adrian Wojnarowski, joins me now here on SportsCenter. And Woj, the timeline for these allegations involved three different teams, the Warriors, the Lakers, and now the Kings. How is the league handling this? Uh, Sage, I spoke with the league office tonight. They're in contact with the Sacramento Kings, and uh, they're going to start to gather more information in this. And our Dave McMenamin reports uh, that the uh, court filing, this is a civil suit, um, is in the process of being filed uh, in L.A. Superior Court. Okay, I know you'll keep us up to date on that developing story. Meantime, back to the team Walton used to coach, the Lakers, and there are a couple of developments in their search for his replacement. McMenamin also reported that the Lakers interviewed former Bucks and Nets coach Jason Kidd yesterday in L.A., and they're scheduled to interview Heat assistant Juwan Howard today. Meantime, late last night, the Suns fired head coach Igor Kokoshkov after just the one season. So, Woj, how does this move impact the Lakers' search? Well, par part of the timing in Phoenix of firing Kokoskov uh, was to pursue Monty Williams, the top assistant in Philadelphia. He's already interviewed once with the Lakers. Uh, they're in the process of setting up a second interview back east, uh, perhaps as soon as this week. And he is at the top of the Suns list. Uh, I was told today that the Suns got permission from the Sixers to interview him. And now Monty Williams, uh, I think his goal, I'm told, is to meet with both ownership groups, uh, with both teams, and, and, you know, start, start to use that as a barometer of what might make sense for him. Monty Williams, a longtime assistant with the Thunder, with the Spurs, certainly one of the more respected people in the NBA. That is our insider, Adrian Wojnarowski. Thank you. Still to come on this edition of SportsCenter, with the Thunder on the brink of elimination, who is Russell Westbrook's toughest enemy tonight in Portland? Plus, is Joel Embiid ready to go again tonight? The latest on the Sixers star big man as Philly tries to close out on the Nets in Game 5. The city's facing tonight in Portland for Game 5. Thunder stars Russell Westbrook and Paul George being outscored by Damian Lillard and C.J. McCollum in this series by 7 points per game. The duo is shooting just 37% from the field. Russ is just 14 of 49 from outside 10 feet, according to second spectrum. That's 29%. George, he hasn't been any better while his shoulder's not healthy. He's getting his points, nearly 27 per, but he's shooting just 37% from the field, 33% from outside 10 feet for the series. Royce Young on what a third straight first-round exit would mean for Russ and the franchise. The Thunder are, once again, on the brink of a first round playoff exit. But this time, there's a new level of shock. This year was supposed to be different. This matchup was favorable. This team was better equipped. But like the last two first round outs, the series has served as a harsh evaluation of the team and specifically Russell Westbrook. The Blazers are openly daring him to shoot and testing his will to resist. It's a game plan that pits Westbrook against his toughest enemy, himself. Westbrook, air ball. Another big miss by Westbrook when they needed one. 
It's not necessarily that Westbrook wants to win on his own terms, but his bulldozer approach without a reliable jump shot to lean on isn't holding up in the postseason. Sometimes you have nights like that. Um, you know, that happens sometimes, uh, but it just wasn't good enough uh, for us to get the win. So. Another first-round exit in Game 5 would make the Thunder 4-12 and in the postseason since Kevin Durant left. And for a team with the second-highest payroll in the NBA, they would enter the offseason with more questions than answers. And for Russell Westbrook, the next question would be a hard one. What now? In Portland, I'm Royce Young, ESPN. Royce, thank you so much. Another game tonight. Nets, Sixers, Joel Embiid coming off that 31-16, seven assist performance. Also had six blocks in 32 minutes, game four, Saturday. Dave McMenamin joining us from Philly with more on Game 5 as the Sixers potentially could wrap things up. It's the question that has dominated every game in this series. What's the status of Joel Embiid tonight? Well, Kevin, an incremental gain in the status department for Joel Embiid. He's been upgraded to probable tonight, but of course, the cat and mouse game between the media and Sixers coach Brett Brown continued. We asked him about it before the game. He said, you guys know the answer. Game time decision. Uh, the way Embiid talked about game five, we certainly expect him to be on the court tonight coming off that dominant performance. Brett Brown added, though, one thing he certainly is concerned about is a flagrant foul situation that Joel Embiid finds himself coming into tonight. Already two flagrant foul points. If he gets two more points, that means a suspension. The Sixers want to stay on the straight and narrow, win the game, and not jeopardize Joel Embiid's status in the second round. All right, the place is going to be rocking. Embiid averaging 25 points per game and shooting 51% from the floor in the series. Last time a Sixers player did that in the best of seven, Charles Barkley in 1991 against MJ's Bulls. Dave McMenamin from Philly. That's just going to be part of the story. If you've played any meaningful basketball in the NBA, you have a shot like that. If you don't, that means you haven't played in meaningful games or you haven't been trusted by your coaches or your teammates to take that shot. He is on a great path in this NBA. And he had a great game last night. Speaking about being on a great path, Mitchell gets it up top, nails the three-pointer. 22 years old, 23 in September, taking over this team as if he was a grizzly veteran. Spins in the lane, hits the shot. Real easy here. Only been in the league two years. He's really special. Jazz is on a 7 to nothing run, starting the fourth. Another three, take another look at it. Mitchell had 13 points to start the fourth quarter. Impressive, as Kyle Korver would say. Jazz up nine, four minutes to go. James Harden turns the ball over. Who's there to take it in for a dunk? The young kid by the name of Donovan Mitchell. Jazz hang on to win 107-91. So after the game, we talked to Mitchell about how he feels. We've had our backs against the wall plenty of times in the past two years. We've been together as a team. You know, I think this is familiar ground with us. I think, you know, everybody responded the way we expected them to. But the biggest thing for us is to take what we did today and multiply it. Of course, we wanted to end it tonight, but uh, we had plenty of opportunities. And, uh, you know, they made some plays in that fourth quarter, and we didn't. I just thought they were the more aggressive team. And, uh, you know, they, they came out like they didn't want to die, and they did a heck of a job on... Uh, being the aggressors early in the first quarter especially, I thought we were sloppy and didn't rebound the ball. Kind of righted the ship, and we start the fourth quarter. I think we're up two or one or maybe tie, whatever. And um, we didn't play very smart. The hustle and the hope. It was able to do a lot of things. Still facing long odds, though. The Jazz are trying to do something that's never been done in NBA history. No team has ever come back from a three-games-to-none series deficit as teams are now 0-134 all-time. So good luck to Jazz. That's tomorrow. See if they can get it done. David, what do you have? I got this Bucks pistons game. The Pistons were trying to dig out of a, a 3 nothing hole. Bucks looking for the first four-game sweep since 1983. Giannis, how about this move on Andre Drummond? Went up for the jam, reconsidered midair because Drummond was coming over, gathered it, and then somehow threw it in. It kind of echoes of the iconic MJ switching hand shot against the Lakers in the finals way back when. It's not quite that good, but still a brilliant midair improv to beat Drummond. He could just laugh at that point. And then Blake Griffin thinks he's got a... A charge? No, it's going on him. I thought Griffin was moving myself, and then the chance starts up. Go, 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 
Sometimes you just get caught up in a good sing-along. It happens. So Blake probably agreeing with the fans. Fourth quarter, this was Giannis's night. It's been his series. It's been his year. The and one, and another call goes against Detroit. Griffin's seen enough. The Bucks made 22 more foul shots than the Pistons. Biggest disparity in a postseason game in four years. Bucks finish off the sweep. Giannis had 41. He's into the second round for the first time in his career. Just to win uh, our first playoff series with this group right here, it's uh, unbelievable. I think we played uh, great basketball, we stuck together the whole uh, uh, series. I remember our first playoff series, uh, we lost from uh, uh, Chicago. The last game, game six, they uh, beat us by 50. It was something insane. Uh, but, you know, where we were and where we are right now, it's, uh, it's been an unbelievable journey. And the journey continues. The Bucks don't stop here. They will face the Celtics in the conference semifinals. The teams met three times in the regular season. Bucks won twice. Kings haven't played since a one-point Bucks win in February. It'll be the seventh time they've met in the postseason, with the Celtics having won five of six, including the 1974 NBA Finals when the Bucks were out west. In the first round last year, they played a seven-game set in which the home team won every game. Giannis is good against everybody, but he really enjoys torturing the Celtics. He averaged 31 and 10 against Boston this season, and he did the same thing last season. Kerry? All right, David, thank you for that assist. The scene is set, and we have the numbers, so our Jalen Rose will give us some context on Celtics and Bucks. So, Jalen, the big storyline in this series is Boston is trying to slow down Giannis. We just mentioned that Giannis averages 30 and 11 against the Celtics, so how do they contain him? So a couple of things, Kerry. Driving to the basket, he's virtually unstoppable as it relates to layups and dunks. So you want to try to crowd the paint and force Giannis to be perimeter-oriented. You'll live with the three-point shot, and you'll play the percentages. But on the other side, when you go against a great player, you can't allow him to relax defensively. And he got my vote for defensive player of the year. However, Al Horford, Baines, Morris, those guys have to be a threat offensively, in particular making jump shots so that you now open up the paint and force Giannis to be out on the perimeter to guard while your playmakers get a chance to penetrate towards the basket. It's going to be fascinating to see this dynamic how, and how it plays out. Side note, uh, is he your MVP, referring to Giannis? He did not get my vote. Kerry Champion, <laughs> I voted for James Harden, and, and here's why. James okay. Harden and Michael Jeffrey Jordan are the only two people to play a season and have 2,700 points, 500 rebounds, and 500 assists. Like right, James, back. what he was doing individually was historic, so he got my vote. All right, I'll get back on track here. Focus on tonight's game five between San Antonio and Denver with the series tied at two apiece. Spurs seemingly had the edge with that first road win. Uh, you've liked, though, some of the adjustments that Denver has made. So as for San Antonio, what could the Spurs do to take over this series? You got to get White back going. He was terrific, had a 30-point game in game three, and they did a great job of slowing him down in game four. They made the adjustment, as you just mentioned, of putting Craig in the starting lineup. He played well did the, for the Nuggets, and Barton off the bench played well. So now for the Spurs, your counter is your veterans. DeMar DeRozan has to have a signature game. Can Rudy Gay give him big quality minutes? Mills making shots off the bench. You need Aldridge to be an anchor down low. Going to Denver and playing in a hostile environment and dealing with the altitude is going to be a challenging thing for the Spurs. They've already gotten a win on the road. The Nuggets seem to be more poised about this playoff thing right now. I think Denver finds a way to get game five as well. Wow. All right. So Denver has never won a best of seven series that was tied at two apiece, going 0 for 3. Jalen with the knowledge and saying perhaps they get the game as well tonight. Thank you for joining us here on Coast to Coast. The champ is here. Appreciate That's right. you. Elite player in the NBA. nails the three-pointer. Beautiful assist from Damian Lillard. Step back, three-pointer. Oh, sweet move from Lillard. The brilliance of Damian Lillard on full display. Uh, bottom of the hour here on Coast to Coast. Let me just make sure I'm checking in. Yeah, 9.30 my time, 12.30 your time, is it not? I haven't checked the clocks, really. I'm, I'm, I'm focused on this Dame Dallas situation. He's trying to close uh, things out.
Do I, is, is that what you're focused on, David? Yes, that's my, that's our, my laser light focus. <laughs> All right, well, let's start uh, with our coast-to-coast -coast map, shall okay. we? Um, Thunder trying to survive. You just talked about it in the series. Down 3-1 to the Blazers. This series, your boy, Dane, 45% from three, while Westbrook struggling, 28%. The Thunder need him to turn it around if they want to try to keep any semblance of a, a postseason alive. I don't know if they can do it, though, David. I love that series. This series is cool, too. In, in Philly, Joel Embiid mm. and the Sixers looking to close out. The Nets up 3-1 at home. You see all the bad blood, the tension. Jared Dudley going into the seats. Jimmy Butler. I Her love this football. stuff. It's great. That's what makes the NBA fun. Yeah, I, it gets serious. We, we're fighting for something. Meanwhile, let's head over to Denver. The Nuggets hosting the Spurs in a game five. Series all tied up to all. After a great showing from Denver, more specifically Donovan Mitchell, we talked about the 22-year-old, and we heard Kyle Korver give him so much praise, so who knows? Meanwhile, uh, David, I'm moving on to some other things here. Yeah, what, got, what are we talking about? We got one more Your playoff turn. basketball game yeah. in Toronto. See if Kawhi and the Raptors, everyone wants to close out. They'll get some rest. Get good, get healthy, get ready for your next series. We'll see if Toronto can finish off Orlando 7 Eastern tonight north of the border. We'll let Kawhi finish. There we go. Okay, good. Thank you. I Here we go. Hockey, your jam. Yeah. Well, I got him pretty good, and I'm sorry about it, uh, but... <laughs> Ben Simmons is a great player in transition, and once you get him in the half court, he's average. Jared Dudley. Y'all don't really want to play games with me. Y'all love has never been the same to me. They don't go win because I came to eat. Yeah, yeah. He is just torching this Nets team. I need my respect. Spit. This is deadly. Misses everything. Yeah, hit high that time by Embiid. Oh, my goodness. Dudley and Simmons into the stand. And they are gone, Butler and Dudley. How I, I thought it was just a, a good push, let them know it was not having it today. Oh, I enjoy it all. Meanwhile, NBA analyst Chine and Gumike joining us ahead of Game 5. Chine, uh, there's been no shortage of drama in this series. We like to recap it several times throughout the show. Nets are down three games to one. So what do you need to see from them tonight in order for them to even try to make this a series? The Nets, they need to keep that same energy from game four. They need that competitive fire and ice combination that we saw down the stretch. And these are the type of plays I'm talking about. D'Angelo Russell with almost the biggest shot of the game, a huge three. He was four for nine from three in game four. He's got to keep that ice in his veins. And on the other end, D'Lo and Karis LeVert were on fire defensively. They combined for 46 points. But look at how intense they were going after loose balls. They will need that same energy on the road <laughs> versus Philly with a Joel Embiid. Yeah, Sixers have been warned that the Nets will try to keep it chippy tonight, so make sure that they stay within their own selves. Meanwhile, out west, the late one, Thunder Blazers, 1030 Eastern. Portland is up three games to one. How do the Thunder even get back in this series? Well, it's not going to be with their offense. It's going to have to be with their defense, and they have to find a way to slow down Damian Lillard because Dame Dollar has been a man on a mission. He has been tied with Kevin Durant at number one in postseason points per game, 28 points per game, and this has to be a four-quarter effort. 66% of his points come in the second half. Again, he's shooting 48% in the second half. Now, if I were the Thunder, I would send the entire cavalry and their mm -hmm. mama at Damian Lillard. Mm -hmm. I would also keep an eye on C.J. McCollum, and then I'd force the rest of the supporting cast to step up because right now, Damian Lillard is looking like a first-team all-NBA type of player. He's playing his best basketball. You have to find a way to slow him down each and every quarter. Okay, so I have that note here. Calvary and mother go at Dane. Everybody. I have that. Everybody. Everybody. Going to be an uphill battle. ESPN BPI gives the Thunder just a 7% chance to win this series. Chanae Ngumake, thank you so much for joining us here on SportsCenter. Speaking of that Dame guy, uh, they basically don't call him Logo Lillard for nothing. Damian Lillard has shot 13 of 20 from 26 feet and beyond this postseason. The most makes in the league. And then what about this? He's 3 of 16 on the three when he has 
a little less space. We're saying he's good at three. He's been at his best in the third quarter, scoring 55 points in that frame this series. That's the most by any player in any quarter. Lillard's been able to probe the defense off the dribble, shooting 57% of those shots, and that's according to Second Spectrum. And he's been able to get his own offense with ease. Lillard is shooting 50% on plays with no passes in the front court. His 26 makes are by far the most on those shots in the league this postseason.